the nature of the mind is to have these little voices and energies inside our brain and that they're all there to help us in our lives. Hey everyone, I'm Morgan, co-founder of Primal Kitchen and host of the Primal Kitchen podcast. In this episode, we'll be discussing the widely used form of trauma healing psychotherapy, internal family systems with creator Dr. Dick Schwartz. Dick began his career as a family therapist and discovered that therapy alone did not achieve full symptom relief and soon his patients became his teachers and he spent his years developing the now evidence-based therapy system that provides an optimistic and empowering perspective in working with individuals, couples, families, and more recently, corporations and classrooms. Before we get started, a brief reminder that any and all opinions and views shared by hosts and guests on this podcast are the speaker's own, do not represent the view of Primal Kitchen or its affiliates or parent company. Hello, Dr. Schwartz, how are you? I'm Oregon, and please call me Dick. I know, you've told me that twice now. It just <laughs> feels wrong, but I'll, I'll abide. <laughs> um, so great to have you. Great to be uh, here. I'm excited. I want to hear, the listeners want to know, how did you get into psychotherapy to begin with, and where did your system come from? Give us the background. Oh, okay. So you've gone way, way back, because I'm an old man, but... Way, way back, yeah. I want to hear the origin story. Yeah, the origin story is actually when I was in college, my father got me a job on the psych unit at the hospital where he worked, and it was a teenage kid unit, and uh, I really didn't know much about psychology at all, but I really got close to these kids, and uh, I would be in the day room when their parents would come visit on the weekends, and I saw how uh, scapegoated these kids were by their families, and then I would hear about their therapy sessions with these psychiatrists, which were anal psychoanalytic, and the families weren't even discussed in the in the therapy sessions. And I thought there's something wrong with this picture, and so I got interested in what I could do to change that. Didn't know anything about family therapy at the time. It, it was really a very nascent field at the time. And then after I graduated and did a lot of odd jobs, had no clue about what. I would do with my life. Um, I heard about this burgeoning field called family therapy, and uh, did a couple degrees in that. And so then, yeah, the rest is history. Awesome. Now, when you say scapegoated, so tell me more. Like, so these kids are like checked into the psych ward, and they're coming in, and they just you can just feel the dysfunction in the family unit. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, and, and you could feel how much the kids were attacked as the big problem and how much, you know, I could even sense it back then that the parents were really hating each other, but they focused on the kid as the problem to come together almost. And Interesting. That was one of family therapy's big insights was that the kids in those positions actually sometimes bring it on themselves to get the parents to stop fighting with each other. Oh, they just start misbehaving and then the attention's diverted elsewhere and they are, that's their way of like healing the family unit. Yeah, that, I mean, that's just one, one of many uh, family pa patterns that create symptoms. Interesting. Um, so then you decided to go, were you always going to be a psych, like were you always going to go into psychology or did this kind of push you in that direction? Yeah, that pushed me in that direction and and then I heard about family therapy and wound up getting a PhD in that. And I was one of these obnoxious family therapists back in those days who thought we'd found the Holy Grail and we could cure anything without having to worry about intrapsychic stuff, stuff going on inside. And I got a job at a prestigious institute here in Chicago area and decided to prove that and wanted to do a outcome study with bulimia, with, because it was a symptom you could count, you know, you could prove that people were getting better, and uh, gathered together about 30 bulimic kids and their families and did family therapy the way the book said to do it, and my kids didn't realize they'd been cured. They kept binging and purging, and out of frustration, I'm really asking why, and they started talking the strange language of parts that to me at the time, I, I, I didn't wasn't at all familiar with, but they would say something like, when something bad happens, this critic starts to attack me inside. 
and that brings up a part that can make me feel totally worthless and young and empty. And that feeling is so distressing that almost to the rescue comes the binge. It takes me away from that emptiness. But the act of the binge brings the critic back, who's calling me a pig now on top of the other names. And that goes right to the heart of that worthless, empty, lowly part. So the binge has to come back. And I was fascinated because it sounded like the kind of patterns that I was studying in families were happening among these different parts of them. And so uh, that was the inception of this internal family systems model. Very interesting. Um, so then you're in practice and you're practicing one way. You go to prove it, you realize it doesn't work. And then you you start to see this other stuff. So then, so then what? Like, where'd that lead you? So I became intrigued with uh, what these kids were teaching me. And, and because I didn't know anything about the inner world, I really had to rely on what they were saying and trust what they were saying rather than come with a, a lot of preconceptions about it. And, uh, you know, long story short, initially I thought these parts were what they seemed. So the critic is just a bundle of, of a kind of a parental critical voice inside and the binge is some out of control impulse. And so when you think of them that way, it's limited what you can do to try and help your client. So I was trying to get, if I was working with you, Morgan, I would say when the critic comes on to you, just stand up for yourself and don't take it and, and, and tell it to stop doing that and to shut up. And I would have you do the various things to try and control the binge. So I was doing that with these kids and it wasn't working, it was actually making things worse, but I didn't know what else to do. And then I had a client who uh, had a terrible sex abuse history and cut herself on her wrists and in addition to her binging. And so I got, I decided that I wouldn't let her keep doing that on my watch. And I, I um, had her tell that to this, this cutting part. And I started talking to the cutting part about how it couldn't keep doing this. And after a couple of hours of badgering it, it agreed not to. And I opened the door to the next session and she had a big gash down the side of her face. And I, I just kind of collapsed at that point and spontaneously said, I give up. I can't beat you at this. And the part said, you know, I don't really want to beat you. And so I shifted into just becoming curious. So why do you do this to her? And it proceeded to tell me the story of how when she was being abused as a child, it had to get her out of her body and it had to contain the rage that would get her more abuse. And this was the only way it knew how to do that. And so with that story, I'd shifted again. Now, not only am I curious about it, but I have a kind of appreciation for the heroic role it played in her life. It literally saved her life. And I convey that to the part, and it breaks into tears because everyone has hated it and tried to get rid of it. And, and so I started trying that same kind of curious approach with other clients and their, their critics or their binge parts or whatever, and they all had a kind of secret history to tell of how they got forced into these roles when they were often when they were children and still are kind of stuck in those places in the past and the traumatic scenes and that they carry these extreme beliefs and emotions that came into the client when those those scenes were happening. And so as I got all that, I just shifted toward helping people listen to and then have a lot of compassion for the parts of them that are causing symptoms or screwing up their lives and came to the conclusion ultimately and and that's held up over these 40 years now it's it's all 40 years ago that there are no bad parts that the the nature of the mind is to have these little voices and and energies inside our brain and that they're all there to help us in our life. But trauma and bad parenting and, and sort of all the slings and arrows you suffer force them out of these naturally valuable states into roles that can be damaging and uh, force them to be frozen in time. They, like if I had you ask some parts of you how old they thought you were, 
it's likely you'd get a single digit. They still think you're a child and they th have to protect you in the same way. So all of that just blew my mind. It just kind of reorganized the way I think about the mind. And uh, yeah, I've been at this 40 years and it's it's held up well. And so we can go to these parts and uh, help them tell their, their stories of how they got forced into these roles and then literally help them transform into their naturally valuable states. Now, when you say you talk to the part, like, what do you mean? Okay, so <laughs> um, <laughs> do you have a critic, Morgan? Oh, sure. I mean, we all have a critic, don't we? Yes, most all of us do. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, I'm sure. I you want to try it for a second? Sure, I'm down. I'm, I'm loving this. Okay, good. All right, so focus on that critical voice and see if it's broadcasting somewhere in your body in particular. See if you notice it somewhere in particular. It's in like my right below my my chest almost, center, like high stomach, mm -hmm. yeah. sternum area. And as you notice it there, how do you feel toward it? You know what I mean, I mean Mother? It feels uncomfortable, kind of like nervous, sweaty, like you want it to go away. I don't know. Well, yeah, right. Which makes sense, right? Because it says these mean things a lot of the time. But for just a few minutes, if the ones who are afraid of it or don't like it and want to get rid of it, if they would relax back a little bit, then we could just get to know it a little bit and see what it might want you to know about itself. So see if that's possible. See if the other parts of you that have issues with it or attitude toward it would give us a little space to let you just get curious about it. I mean, I can relax the other parts of my body, but it, it, it's still kind of there, but lesser. Well, no, it's not, we don't want it to go away. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I just want you to get curious about it. So are you open to getting to know it? Yeah. All right. So okay. focus on that place in your body and just ask it why it's so hard on you. And don't think of the answer. Just wait and see what comes. So don't think. Just focus on that place in your body. Ask that question and wait and see if the, an answer comes to you. I mean, in my mind came, because you're not worthy slash ready. This is okay. weird, but that's just what popped through my mind. No, that's now you're doing it. That's perfect. So ask it more. This is a good question. Ask it what it's afraid would happen if it stopped being so hard on you. And again, don't think. Just wait and see what comes back. Tell me the question one more time. What's it afraid would happen if it wasn't so hard on you this way? I mean, I'm getting like nothing, but maybe that's an answer in and of itself. <laughs> no, um, we can do this a different way if you if you're up for it. Where I could sure. talk to I can talk to the critic directly. Okay, that'd be okay. Yeah. So I'll ask some questions and just whatever comes, let it come out of your mouth. Okay. Okay. So you're there? Are you willing to talk to me? Yes. So you're pretty hard on Morgan, is that right? Yes. And tell me what kind of things you say to her a lot of the time. You're unprepared. You're unprofessional. To be a better mom. Okay. So you, you critique a, a wide range of her life, is that right? Yes. And what are you afraid would happen if you stopped doing that? It's just like blocked. Like nothing's coming. Nothing's coming? Okay. No. It could be that, am I still talking to you as the, as the critic? Maybe you're talking to Morgan now, but let me yeah, just try again. Be, let, let, me, let me see if I can talk to the critic again. Okay. It might be that you're just, you don't even know what would happen. You just think this is your job and you have to do it. Is that true? Probably. Or part of me 
I don't know if this is, just came in, but feels like nothing would happen. Like, you mean nothing? You would do nothing. You, you'd yeah, be... like I wouldn't be motivated to do anything better. Okay. Or right. I would just be. Okay. Yeah, like it's almost like a driving force. I'm just Got verbal diarrhea right now, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're trying to motivate Morgan all the time to work harder, look better, do do the right thing, something like that. Yeah. Okay. And does she listen to you most of the time, or does she react in that way, or does she try to shut you out? She listens. I think she listens. Okay. And so you are afraid if, if you didn't do this, she wouldn't be motivated to try hard or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Let's say you could trust that she still would try hard and do do well without you having to do this job to her. Is there something else you'd like to do instead if you were freed from this role? I mean, just breathe came to my mind, but I don't know yeah. where. Yeah, so you would like to help her maybe relax and breathe. Does that sound right? Or the critic wants to breathe. I don't know. Maybe okay, the critic just, uh, needs a break. All right. Well, let's let me talk to you again, and you you've talked to the critic. So ask it if that's right. If it wants a rest or wants to breathe. I mean, it's kind of like the sensation is going away, like almost. Yeah, it's relaxing. Can't feel it. Anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So let it know this has been a really hard job. It's it's had to really work all the time to push you and you get that now and see how it reacts to your empathy I mean in when I was talking to the critic I was like it must be exhausting this is a hard okay. job like oh, wait. and ah. it said back to me like yes it's been exhausting <laughs> sort of right. an acknowledgement of like this is exhausting yeah Okay, and one more question for it. Ask it how old it thinks you are. Again, don't think of the answer. I mean, nine came nine. right to yeah. my... Yeah. Okay. So let it know that when you were nine, it may have had to do this job. Not, this might have been necessary when you were nine, but you're older than nine now. So let it know how old you are and see how it reacts to that information. I mean, I just got like, yes, I know. Okay. So I wasn't impressed by that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. But on your own, you can ask if there's something it wants you to know about what was happening when you were nine that made it jump into this role. You don't have to share that with us if you don't want. I mean, all that came was like you were, and then it was like tears, and then that's the last word I got, and then it just kind of went to blankness. Okay. So it sounds like it's implying that you were very sad or you were hurt or something like that. Does that sound right? Perhaps. Okay. We don't have to speculate. But... As you've gotten to know it this way, how do you feel toward it now? I mean, a little more sympathetic. Yeah. Yeah. So let it know that. Let it know you get that it's been forced into a role that's been very taxing and hard on it, and that it's really, really just trying to help you do stuff, motivate you. Just see if there's a reaction. I mean, in the subconscious was kind of like, yes, because you wouldn't be good enough. It's like, right. I hear you, kind of that thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it's got a lot of beliefs about how good you're supposed to be and so on. Yeah. That would take more exploring to help it yeah. with. But this is a really good start on a new relationship with it. So thank it, and, and thanks to you for 
for taking this risk and being so open and with your audience. Yeah. Yeah, so interesting. So shifting away from my inner critic, <laughs> I like so many questions were coming up for me. Uh, this is probably like a little hard to focus, but that was very interesting, like how things just kind of pop in your head, right? And I remember like the first time I meditated ever when I was, I know I can remember where I was. I was at the pool in the town I grew up in, in the suburbs of Chicago. And I was reading a book that my Buddhist therapist at the time had recommended, like kind of like an introduction to meditation type book. And it was like, you know, sit back and listen to your thoughts. And just, I remember being astonished at like what was going on in my brain in yeah. behind you know, behind the scenes that I just wasn't even aware of. I'm like, this is what happens when I just don't think about anything and all these things that come up. So it kind of reminded me a little bit of just another form of astonishment at what's going on that we're not even just like consciously of aware of. That's right. And, you know, what you were practicing was a kind of mindfulness meditation. Yeah. Which, as you know, is really uh, popular now in the, the wellness community. And so this what I just had you do is mindfulness plus because you're not just observing your thoughts and so on. You're actually interacting with them and you're, you're getting to know them as separate entities, which yeah. uh, is the beginning of the work with IFS. Very cool. Now, okay, so many things came up for me. There's so many questions I have for you. So I would say... Um, it, does everyone benefit from this work or is it specifically folks who have had like maybe some trauma they can't get past? Now, most of us have had some sort of trauma or uh, have parts stuck somewhere in the past. So uh, it isn't just people that are severely traumatized that, that benefit from it. It's it's most all of us, really. Yeah, yeah. because I'm not one who like, even when like the number nine came up, like fortunately for me, I'm not one. I don't have any like big big traumas in the sense of like sexual abuse, physical abuse, anything that really stands out. I'm sure I have many traumas, um, which, you know, and I think there's a blend in all of us, right? Like I think, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just curious your take on like how many folks are dealing with like overcoming just, but how would you even describe, what are we even overcoming here? Just parental expectations on children first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's ranging right. from that all the way to severe abuse in your childhood, like. That's right. I mean, I didn't have any big T trauma either as a kid, and I'm still working on parts of me that were stuck in scenes where my father was yelling at me about how lazy I was or things like that. So it doesn't take a yeah. lot for a sensitive kid to take on these kinds of burdens. Yeah. And then it kind of shapes how pleasing we are or how rebellious we are or what kind of goes from there in it. So, okay, I'm a parent. I have three boys under the age of five, okay? So this is like enlightening and terrifying to me at the <laughs> same time because how do we as parents um, like handle this information? We know we have such a, you know, and right, you just heard my inner child or my inner critic who's like, you're not a good enough mom. So of course I'm immediately going to like, what am I going to do to mess my kids up? Like, what do I need to know based off this that just sets my kids up for the least amount of capital T trauma? Um, and then there's also the saying, my mom's friend, I remember telling her, like, you know, you've made it in life calling when your kids can afford their own therapy. Like that's when you've, when you've made it as a, as a parent, which I always find comical. So tell me, what are your tips for parents then in light of all this like research? Yeah. You know, um, first of all, you will burden your kids. It's, you just can't avoid it with some of your stuff that just kind of passed through the generations. But the more you can become aware of the other thing I haven't talked about yet in this model is what I call the self with a capital S. And so there is a place inside of us that I just stumbled into finding by getting these parts to separate that knows how to be a good parent, both in the inner world and the outer world, and, and contains qualities. I, I call it the eight C's of self-leadership. So calm, curiosity, confidence, compassion, courage, creativity, clarity, and connectedness. And I was shocked as I would help people with these parts that at a certain point, as I, like, with when we started, I had you 
I asked you, how do you feel toward the critic? And you had a lot of attitude toward it and fear of it, right? But we got those parts, we got those parts to step back some and relax. And suddenly you were curious about it and you could have this kind of reasonable dialogue with it. And as I was fooling around, I would find that over and over, that as clients had these parts open space inside, it was like the other per this other person would pop out and knew how to relate to their parts in a healing way, but also knew how to relate to their kids in a healing way. So there is this in us, it's our, an essence that can't be damaged and knows how to heal and is just beneath the surface of these parts. So when I'm working with parents, I'm helping them both notice the parts of them that get so triggered by their kids and tend to take over when they're trying to parent, and then work with those parts so they trust the self to relate to their kids. And when they can do that, um, they don't even need to take classes. They just kind of know how to be a good parent. Interesting. And you're working with folks like on all range of issues. Like, are you seeing people who have like suffered from bulimia, for instance, or I'm assuming like you've got to be dealing with like addiction issues and all sorts of stuff, right? Am I off base here? Yeah, we apply IFS to all kinds of things. And I'm not doing much clinical work anymore. I'm doing more teaching and things like that, writing. But when I was, yeah, I, that was my population, not just eating disorders, but uh, a lot of people with really severe trauma that had all the heavy-duty diagnoses. There was a point where I saw that this could work with people that weren't so hurt so badly, but uh, I actively recruited people with those diagnoses so that I could see if this actually did work with all that heavy-duty stuff. And what did you find? Like, what what was the result of all the work? Yeah, that's what I found. Uh, uh, even people who not only cut themselves, but, did, you know, had really severe addictions or dissociation or that all of those were the activities of protective parts. And so if I was working with you, Morgan, and, and suddenly you dissociated, I wouldn't think, oh my God, you're, you're crazier than I thought. I would say, Morgan, there's a part that just took you out. Could we get to know it and why it did that just now? Or if you had a, a big impulse to go and get drunk, it's not an addiction. It's a part that's trying to protect you by getting you away from some other part. It's afraid that's going to take over and make you feel bad. Yeah. So we would, I would say, Morgan, just focus on that impulse to go drink and get curious about it and ask what it's afraid would happen if it didn't do this for you. And in doing that, two things happen. One is you have a totally different understanding of these parts and why they're doing what they're doing. And then you, as yourself, start to relate to them in a, in a different way, in a much more compassionate way. And, and then they start to trust yourself as a leader. And as they, once they trust you as the leader, it's much easier to say to the one who wants to drink, yeah, I get why you want to protect me that way, but just let me handle this. You don't have to do it right now. And you find that addictive part just kind of relaxes and lets you move on. Yeah. And what would you say like your success rate was with this kind of therapy and how long does it normally take? Like how many sessions? Mm -hmm. So I um, won't be like work like. There are a number of different outcome studies. Uh, we did one, for example, with PTSD, and um, all but one client stopped having PTSD symptoms after about 16 sessions. Uh, and there's an, another study that's got a control group with PTSD based on the first one coming out um, this fall, and uh, we're looking to have pretty comparable results. So it's, a, it's been very effective. Um, the original outcome study was actually with rheumatoid arthritis. We would have, I would have you focus on the pain and get curious about the pain in your joint and ask what it was trying to tell you. And the part giving you the pain would talk about how you've got this other part that takes care of everybody and doesn't let you take care of yourself. 
and it was trying to get a message through that you can't keep doing that. And we would work that polarization out inside and people's arthritis would get a lot better. So, um, yeah. And, you know, with some kind, it depends on the level of trauma. I and mean, there are people who were chronically abused throughout most of their childhood who just takes a long time. It takes years to heal all of those parts that are stuck back there. But, you know, many other people, it's just a, uh, you know, so maybe f half a dozen sessions sometime. Fascinating. Um, wow, it's so interesting. Rheumatoid arthritis even, gosh, this is like all manner of, do you think all these diseases like manifest or a lot of them are manifesting? Like what other things are manifesting in our body from past traumas? You mean uh, physical symptoms? Yeah. You know, like IBS, like what other things do you think manifest? Am I, I get migraines. Like wh what other what other things are manifesting from past? You want to do a piece with your migraine thing? I'm I'm looking for anything with my migraines. Oh, he's really? yes. You tell. Okay. He's, yes, my migraines are a pain in the butt. <laughs> All right, because I used to have migraines, and I I did a big piece of work. I don't get them anymore at all. Really? I still get the aura sometimes, but I never get the headache. Okay, tell me more. Well, uh, you wrote, you want to try it? Yeah. All right, so you don't have a headache now, I assume, but maybe you focus, focus on the memory of a recent headache. Yeah. So to find that in your body or around your body? Yeah, it's always my like right temple okay, and above good. my, like this is where always my migraine is, right here. Right good. temple, right above my right eye. So as you notice it there, how do you feel toward it? Cold. It makes you feel cold or you feel cold toward it? I feel cold toward it. I don't know if that was just the first thing that came to my okay, mind. Right. But again, ask if your parts will let us try and get to know it instead of keep you distant and cold from it. I mean, it just says, it's like, no. <laughs> Okay. Never tell me that. Yeah. But okay. ask them why they don't want you to try to get to know it. It gets none of your face. Okay. Are they saying that to you or to me? To me. I don't know. To me. Okay. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. So we're not going to work with the migraine yet or today. Okay. <laughs> okay. We, we are curious about these parts that say it's none of your business. Is that okay? If we talk to them yeah. a little yeah. Yeah, so ask them why they think it's none of your business. Why? What What are they afraid would happen if you talk to the migraine? It was like it would go away. And what would be bad about that? Do they Do they rely on it for something? I mean, this is so weird. It's like for keeping Morgan in line. Okay. <laughs> This is like so foreign. I mean, I'm on all sorts of therapy and I'm like pretty open. I live in Southern California, but this is, it requires like an extra level of vulnerability, huh? I'm yes. timing out. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it does. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So they've been using your migraines to keep you in line. So let them know you get that. And let them know we're not going to mess with that. But... Ask him, and again, you don't have to tell me, but ask him what kind of out of line are they worried about without the migraines? It's like overdoing it? Overdoing work or overdoing what? Light. Okay, so they use the migraines to hold back parts of you that would overdo it. Is that right? Slow me down. Slow you down, yeah. Does that make any sense to you, Morgan? Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty type A, like go, go, go. I get that. Clearly, I have another part of my body that's trying to make me better at everything, so <laughs> no pressure. Okay, so let these parts know they've got a point that because they can't slow you down other ways, they're going to use your migraines to do that. Okay, okay, we hear you. Improve it, they're saying. <laughs> so, 
you know, we don't have to keep going, but if we were to, and, you know, if I was to work with you, the next stop would be the parts of you that are type A and do make you overdo. And we would work with them so they didn't do that all the time and then come back to these so they could see they didn't necessarily have to use the migraines anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah, fascinating. This is so interesting. So you're doing like clinical studies on this work and like when you say outcome studies, like are you working with a research institution and trying yeah. different things or where where is your work at these days? Yeah, the big outcome study uh, that I mentioned is at a place called um, Cambridge Health Alliance, which is uh, one of Harvard's teaching hospitals. So I have a teaching a, 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 yeah, a teaching appointment there and uh, but there are other places that we're doing some research. So yeah. Fascinating. Um, okay, you've recently started implementing this in like classrooms and corporations. So like, is most of the therapy made up of sessions like we just did? Or is it like a combo of talk therapy and a little bit of this? Um, and then how does how does this come into play in like the classroom or in the corporate world? Yeah, well, I'll start with the corporate world. So um, yeah, I developed this as a psychotherapy, but it's kind of uh, grown beyond that. And so we're training, for example, executive coaches to help people like you that run organizations notice the parts of them that get in their way and be able to bring more what we call self-leadership. You know, those eight C-word qualities I mentioned uh, would help you notice when you're in that place with your employees and when you're not because that state of self is contagious. So if you can be in that place, it ripples throughout your company. But if you're in one of these protective parts or even the type A part, that also gets contagious and makes everybody anxious or makes them work too much. So we're just bringing this self-leadership to corporate leaders and having it sort of infect their companies and and similarly, in the classroom, we're teach helping teachers do that. Uh, we're helping teachers also, when their students get upset, don't put them in time out. Just help them find the part that's so upset and help them comfort it rather than shaming them with time out or whatever they're going to do. Interesting. Yeah. Um. At what age, like you said, most it's mostly single digit, like where people are, when you talk to the inner critic, it's a lot of like they're under the age of 10, would you say, is like when yeah. most of this kind of trauma, big or little, is happening? Yeah. Yeah, most of these, again, I just want to emphasize these parts, like that critic, that's not what it is inherently. That's the role it got forced into when you were, was it nine? Yeah. Um, but before it got forced into that role, it was a valuable inner player. It was a part of you that probably had some totally different role. So all the parts start out in their naturally valuable states, but then they're forced into these extreme roles by what happened when you were a kid, most of the time when you're a kid. And so the goal is to help them return to that valuable place and unload the feelings and beliefs that they carry from those traumas. Yeah. Yeah. Now tell me something. This is like a little bit off topic. I'm just curious your thoughts on it. I feel like, I mean, there's a lot of research coming out now on just like antidepressant use and SSRIs, and I'm not knocking anybody who's on an antidepressant because I hear that this is like a needed thing. But I start to wonder, my husband and I were having this conversation the other night, like, do we have an overuse of antidepressants and SSRIs in the world right now? And also, like, do people realize, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I do believe that one of the side effects of antidepressants is depression. And there are other, some other negative stuff coming out on just, like, SSRIs and negative side effects. Like, what's your take on all of that? So I'm not anti-medication per se for th conditions like that. I'm anti-medication as the answer and as the long-term solution. So there are uh, situations where client is so wrapped up in these parts that they need a break and, and the medication yeah. can chill them out for a little while and allow 
a little bit more self to merge, and then they can start doing the work better. But as they start doing the work, then they have less and less need for the medication. So yeah. that, that's my take on it. Interesting. Do you, why do you think, do you, is there a rise in all of this like depression and anxiety in the world? What do you think is going yeah. on? In yeah. this country, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, for some, some good reasons, you know, with climate change and AI and all the things we're facing and Donald Trump and, I don't know what your politics are, but he he's a shit disturber, so. Yeah. It's just more stress in the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, yeah. you know, even though the economy is in a good place right now, um, it's still true that 60% of people live paycheck to paycheck. So there's a huge amount of economic insecurity, and there's still a lot of racism that keeps people exiled in, in various ways, and bombards them every day with uh, being triggered. And so there's a lot of reasons that many people, in, at least in this country, are chronically triggered. And when you're in that state, you're going to have to have some of these other protective parts that get you away from it somehow. Yeah. Are there any techniques from IFS that people could do at home? Or like, have you trained a bunch of other practitioners? Like you said, you're not practicing much clinically these days? Like, are there people trained under you? Like, how can people get help if they're interested in this modality? Yeah, we have an institute, and the website is uh, ifs-institute.com. And we have a lot, a lot of trainers who are running training programs for therapists. So we train, I, th I think last year it was uh, something like 3,000 therapists around the world. It's, it's all around the world now. Uh, we, we haven't brought it directly to the public yet, but they're, we're starting to consider doing that. And there is a way that people can do this on their own. It, it becomes less of a psychotherapy and more of a kind of life practice. So that, you know, ideally, Morgan, you'd wake up in the morning and you'd notice what parts are around and what they needed from you, and you would talk to them a little bit in the morning, and then as you went through your day, or if you had some event like this podcast that you had to do, you would check in, you would see how everybody's doing, what do they need from you to let you handle the podcast, uh, and like that. So it becomes a, a daily practice, and there are some people who can do the whole thing and really heal a lot of their parts on their own. So it's quite amazing. I can't do that. I need somebody to be there with me at the time. But So what, did you train someone and they help you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I trained sessions with somebody, yeah. That's cool. You meant, you meant, you were the mentor for someone and then you said, hey, colleague, can you uh, do a little mm -hmm. of my own medicine on me type mm -hmm. of thing? Type of situation. Water it. Um, as like a parent, looking back, and I'm stuck on this because I'm just curious. Um, and I know your daughter. We went to college together. For those listening that don't know this, there's no reason you would. Um, but Sarah and I went to college together. You're and I heard you on the Ritual podcast, and I was like, Sarah, is this your dad? You need to introduce me. I have to talk to him. So that's how he ended up here. But um, very interesting conversation on Ritual for anybody who listens to that podcast. Check it out. But um. You have three three girls, right? Is it? Do you look back after like knowing what you know now, wishing you did anything different as a parent, like when you were raising your girls? Oh my god, of course, yeah. Like, tell me more. I want to know what <laughs> what it is. Come on. You should get Sarah on here, and she can tell. <laughs> tell all. But, um, you know, I was uh, partly I was not present as much as I would want to be because I was trying to develop this thing. And yeah. so I, I left much of the child rearing to my ex-wife, who actually turned out to be a great mother. So I was lucky that way. Yeah. Woman. And so, yeah, the, I think some of the wounds my kids still have, and, and my move back to Chicago to be with them has helped a lot, was just uh, feeling like I was that absent father too much. And yeah. So if I had it to do over, uh, I would just find a way to both be present and also work on this. I think that's the biggest one for me. Yeah. 
And that's a tough balance. It's hard. Tough. It's like our child rearing age kind of like lines up with our like career up, age. Yeah, it's right. a tough balance. Yeah. And you wind up wrestling with that type A part of you that, uh, you know, has its own set of goals that aren't necessarily in coordination with your your child rearing. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Okay. I ask everyone this, um, that comes on the podcast is like my final question, but, and you kind of, you just opened up. So you just shared with me something that I'm sure most people don't know, but I'm going to ask you for another thing. What is something most people don't know about you? Like crazy Ooh. story, hidden talents, anything that comes to mind? I wish I had hidden talents. I, I'm, I'm good at one thing, which I've demonstrated here today yeah. twice, but um, what, what do they, what would they not guess about me? I could play it safe and say I played football in college at my size because I'm very short and but I was very fast. I love um, it. How tall are you? Right now I'm five five. I was maybe five seven when I played. Okay. I love uh, it. Where'd you play? I played at a division three school called Knox College in Illinois. You might have heard of it since you're of course, yeah. Illinois. Yeah. Okay. That's a good one. Um but if I was to be more vulnerable you know, most people don't realize how much worthlessness I came out of my family with and how much that drove me to create this thing. So, uh, so I, yeah, I have parts that carried that burden. It really, it really did motivate me. So, so you could relate with me when I was having this inner critic that was. Oh, yeah. Motivational. Totally. <laughs> Interesting. I, I have to tell you, Morgan. That guy has retired. He's 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 he helps me be discerning now. He's not criticizing, and it's a much easier way to live. And I still I'm still very productive. So, yeah. So you're gonna make an exception, take me on as a client, <laughs> pick up your clinical work again, or referring me to someone really good. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> yeah, I can certainly do the last thing you said. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I know you just told folks, but is there anywhere else they can find you or else they can go to ifs-institute.com, right? There are lots of videos of me on YouTube. Uh, there are, you know, I'm all over uh, Google. If you Google me, you'll find all kinds of stuff. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us today, Dick. I appreciate it. Um, and we look forward to folks who are listening, learning more. <laughs>